Amen. Well, we're going to carry on with our Revelation series this morning. And we're looking at the scripture that is found in Revelation chapter 1, verses 9 to 20 this morning. You can read along on the screen, or you can open your Bibles, whichever you choose. Some uh, look on our phones. And it says this, Revelation 1, verses 9 to 20. I, John, am your brother and your partner in suffering, and in God's kingdom and in the patient endurance to which Jesus calls us. I was exiled to the island of Patmos for preaching the word of God and for my testimony about Jesus. It was the Lord's day, and I was worshiping in the Spirit. Suddenly, I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet blast. It said, write in a book everything you see, and send it to the seven churches in the cities of Ephesus, Smyrna, Pegamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. When I turned to see who was speaking to me, I saw seven gold lampstands. And standing in the middle of the lampstands was someone like the Son of Man. He was wearing a long robe with a gold sash across his chest. His head and his hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like flames of fire. His feet were like polished bronze refined in a furnace, and his voice thundered like mighty ocean waves. He held seven stars in his right hand, and a sharp two-edged sword came from his mouth, and his face was like the sun in all its brilliance. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as if I were dead. But he laid his hand on me and said, Don't be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I died, but look, I'm alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and the grave. Write down what you have seen, both the things that are now happening and the things that will happen. This is the meaning of the mystery of the seven stars you saw on my right hand and the seven gold lampstands. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. So, Father, I just pray that you would uh, make clear your word to us this morning and that you would help us to understand what it is that you are saying to your church in this day. In Jesus' name, amen. So here's John. And it's towards the end of the reign of Domitian, who banished the Apostle John in the mid-90s to Patmos because he refused to stop preaching the gospel. All of the other original apostles were dead, the church was discouraged and dispersed, Jerusalem had been devastated, the Lord had been gone for more than 60 years, and the only living apostle of Jesus was an old man in his 90s, banished to a barren island. The Christian church was facing severe persecution. Almost all the believers were socially, politically, or economically suffering because of this empire-wide persecution, and some were even being killed for their faith. It was not a good time for the church. But out of that bleak darkness, out of that time, the light of God's holy word came to John on Patmos. And the message was this, be courageous, be encouraged, and be ready because Jesus is still ruling. He's still ruling from heaven, and he's coming back again. Now, John, to make sure that the church knew the validity of this vision that he was about to describe, John identifies himself three times in the first nine verses. It's me. It's really me. Hey, fellow believers, hang in there. It's me, John, your brother, your companion in tribulation. He used... Your brother was a common term of endearment among Christians of the first century. You know, we're all equal. I might be a preacher, but we're all equal in Christ. And so it was the Lord's day. 
which had been set aside by the early church to celebrate Christ's resurrection. And even in John's time of exile, he remembered the Lord's day. He wouldn't have had a calendar. He wouldn't have had a cell phone. He wouldn't have had anything. But he went through day after day, week after week, month after month, without having any way of of trying to keep track of the time, but he knew it was the Lord's day. He knew it was the Lord's day, and he made sure that he honored the Lord's day. Very different to sometimes how we think about the Lord's day today, isn't it? It's just another day of the week. Church is just one of those activities that we do on a certain day of the week. Do you remember what Sundays used to be like in this country? 30, 40 years ago. Sundays, everything closed. You might have had a a gas station or a corner store or a few of the necessity things that would be open. But unless you were working in emergency services and that type of thing, everything shut down. The sidewalks rolled up for Sunday. You did your shopping on all the other six days of the week. And even non-Christians... They knew what Sunday was. They knew it was a day of rest. They knew that the the reason that we did that was it was stemmed from the Bible. You know, they had some knowledge of why we did that. People would dress up in their very best to attend church. If you remember, if you were a lady, you would always wear a dress. You would always wear dress shoes. At one time, ladies didn't ever wear pants or slacks. And at one time, I can even remember women still wore a hat or something on their head. Men wore a a three-piece suit and a tie. It was a big thing to go to church. And you went whether it was raining, whether it was snowing, whether it was foggy or hailing. If church was open, you went. I can remember walking in the rain to church on Sunday morning because that was an important part of our week. And now it's often treated just as a a common day and not rated very high on our priority list sometimes. No, we have other things to do and we have other business to take care of or sometimes I just don't feel like going to church today. Pull the covers back up over your head. But here's the thing, and I'm I'm, I'm kind of heading into a cul-de-sac here. Can I do that this morning? If we want to make a serious impact for the kingdom, then we have to honor God as worth something more than the many excuses that we offer to shift him to the bottom of our pile. Did you hear that? If we seriously desire that revelation, because that's, that's what this year and this season is about, having more revelation, greater revelation, that our eyes would see and our ears would hear the greater things of the Spirit. If we seriously desire the revelation that we're looking for, then we, we have to position ourselves. If we really want to do those things that exceed our own ability and do the impossible stuff with God, we need to be people who are ready to honor God with our lives. And that means making time for him and not treating our relationship with him as something just common. It's not a common relationship. By prayer, when... I spend time with God is often asking, God, give me an undivided heart. Give me a heart that doesn't find pleasure in worldly things. Give me a heart that isn't half-hearted about my love for you. Give me a heart that's not tossed to and fro with circumstances that come my way. I want an undivided heart. You sit on the throne of my heart, and I don't want anything else to throw you off. I don't want anything else to take your place. And so I I just feel I need to say this this morning, that we have to do away with being spiritually double-minded. 
We have to do away with being spiritually double-minded. The New Living Translation uses the words in James being double-minded as being having divided loyalty between God and the world. A double-minded person has no steadfast conviction concerning their faith in God. If something of the world tickles their interest, then they have no persuasion for faith one way or the other. And when we are spiritually double-minded, we have no persuasion or conviction when it comes to tampering with or engaging in worldly things, which, as children of God, we are called to stay away from. As servants of the Most High God, we're called to stay away from them. And, you know, sometimes it's just because we haven't maybe learned about that stuff yet. But often we just choose to ignore the implications of what that is. And it's often hearing about those kinds of things that causes pastors to have to take a lot of heat. Don't tell me what I should and shouldn't be persuaded by. But scripture does. And so we have to remove ourselves from the place of being comfortable or complacent with being spiritually double-minded. As in, I'm okay not having an opinion one way or the other. It's that white elephant in the room topic. But you know, when people are simply wandering in the zone of the unknown in things like that, it leaves them open for attack. Amen? Who's with me so far? So Paul included in his letter to Timothy to preach the word, whether it's in season or out of season, out of season whether people want to hear it or not. You preach that word. And so here's the truth. We can't expect to receive godly spiritual insight while we are tampering with worldly or demonic things. Amen? If our allegiance is not 100% in line with Jesus Christ, if my mind is not 100% centered on Christ, I can't expect to attain the mind of Christ. If my body, soul, and spirit does not come into alignment with the Holy Spirit and the Word of God, I cannot expect to operate in signs, wonders, and miracles. Amen. Amen. Now, I'm not talking about being perfect when I say 100%. I'm talking about being made perfect according to Hebrews 10.14. He's forever making perfect those who are holy. And that's why I... I feel especially today compelled to share some thoughts before getting coming out of the cul-de-sac concerning Halloween. I know this is kind of the white elephant in the room. Everybody wants to have their own opinion, but I'm going to share with you what I know. And the decision ultimately is yours, but I need to share some stuff. And do your own research on this. If you're unsure about what I'm saying to you, do your own research. But my conviction started to come alive concerning Halloween in the early 1990s. Halloween is a pagan celebration. The demonic world is alive and well on Halloween night. Both people who are involved in witchcraft and the occult are celebrating demonic rituals tonight. I read a book from uh, an author, Joanna Michelson. Uh, she wrote a book in 1986 or 1988 called, like, Lambs to the Slaughter. And this is what she says. She said, because she was part of the occult at one time, and she came out of the occult, she's now serving God, and, and she was writing this uh, to share with the church. She says, in her experience with the occult, that on Halloween night, they take a newborn baby from among their, their group, and they sacrifice it to Satan. 
They will impregnate a woman in order to, for the nine-month gestation, try to time it out so that she will give birth to a baby that will be chosen to be sacrificed tonight. And if that baby's not born on time, they do their own cesarean section on her. And they have their own rituals for their sacrifice that they do. On this night, they will often do a crucifixion in mockery of Jesus. And when I read this kind of material, there's more in that book. I invite you to look it up and and get it for yourself. But when I read this kind of material, every Halloween night that there was for the next several years, because all this happens around midnight, this is the pagan New Year celebration. For the next several years, around 11, between 10 and 12 o'clock at night, I would literally hear in my spirit babies crying. And it riveted me to the core. And the more I learned about Halloween, the more I couldn't get my head around why people who profess to believe in Jesus Christ and agree with the word of God are okay laughing and entertaining the very things that are not, we're not only told to stay away from, but the very things that stand at the gates of hell and mock my Savior who gave his life for me. And so I say all that this morning because we're talking about revelation. If we want to be used in areas of revelation, we have to not be spiritually double-minded, laughing and and being okay with demonic things, and then wanting revelation. It doesn't work that way. And so let's come back out of the cul-de-sac. John tells us that he was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. And this probably describes a visionary state where the outer world has been shut out and the the spiritual part of him became very aware of the invisible realm. And suddenly John hears a loud voice which, which calls him, summons him to solemn attention and describing it as that of a trumpet. That trumpet would have been a familiar instrument to John. He would have known the sound of what it sounded like, and so he just tried to describe the voice as that of a trumpet. And if you've ever stood right beside a trumpet, if you've ever maybe in a small room or or at Remembrance Day, the emphasis of the trumpet is to call to attention something of importance. And so this voice was calling John to attention and giving him instruction for what he was about to see. The emphasis is on the force and the authority with which that voice spoke. We need to talk at this juncture about symbolic interpretation. What John was seeing was a picture of the Lord. If you look through all of the Gospels, nowhere in the Gospels does it actually describe what Jesus looked like. And so, in, in Isaiah, um, we're told that he has no special features that would cause him to stand out. In his humanity, the divine nature of Jesus was veiled. But in Revelation 1, we have a description of what Jesus looks like as the glorified Lord in heaven. And here's where we need to talk about the idea of symbol- symbolism in the book of Revelation. I found this yesterday as I was going through some old photos and stuff. It says, the benefits of a good vocabulary. I recently called an old engineering buddy of mine and asked what he was working on these days. He replied that he was working on aquathermal treatment of ceramics, aluminum, and steel under a constrained environment. Well, I was impressed until upon further inquiry, I learned that he was washing dishes with hot water under his wife's supervision. (laughs) The importance of words to describe things. A common question is, do we take the book of Revelation to be literal or figurative? 
Well, the answer is we need to interpret it naturally and symbolically. We use symbolic language all the time. We would say, I'm on top of the world today. Well, does that mean we're actually standing on top of the planet, the world? No, it means, wow, I'm feeling so good. I am ecstatic, you know, maybe about something that just happened. I say all the time, I wish I had a green thumb. <laughs> I'm not much of a gardener, I'm learning. I'd like to have more of a green thumb, but is it literal? I'd really like to walk around with a green thumb. What about the huge player, jersey number 13, was running after the flying pigskin like a mad dog chasing after a gray hare? Did you follow that? If I was to interpret that, the Goliath-sized player who typically had bad luck pursued with a vengeance a hollowed-out pig like a demon-possessed dog running after a gray wig. Who followed that? <laughs> so wording in scripture is understood through the writer's eyes and experience. Here's a biblical example. Revelation 3.12 tells the church in Philadelphia that those who are victorious will become pillars in the temple of my God. Does this mean they're going to be turned into architecture made of stone for all of eternity? That doesn't sound too exciting. But then you flip over to Revelation 21 verse 22 and John says, I saw no temple in the city for the Lord God Almighty and the lamb are its temple. So what's going on? First there's a temple and then there's not. But to understand this symbolically, pillars are the most intimate part of a structure. Without pillars, a building will collapse. And so here we can read it through John's symbolic lens and know that it's describing intimacy, not architecture. This was an invitation to a deep, intimate relationship with the Lord God Almighty and the lamb. Numbers are weighed in meaning rather than placing into a logical sequence as well. For example, we talked about the number seven being very important. Even in our culture, if I say the words 9-11, it's not that I've skipped number 10, but those two numbers put together, they mean something. They carry weight for something. It automatically jogs your memory where you were when you heard the news on September 11th, right? And so we know that numbers carry weight. And so John tries to describe this vision. Symbols are intended to describe what words can't say. And so John is using a lot of symbolism that we need to try and interpret what he's trying to say. So in this passage that we just read, John describes the Jesus that he saw. And because this vision of Jesus is pretty much indescribable, John resorts to symbolic and comparative language as he struggles to put into words what he was seeing. He draws from his knowledge in, in the book of Daniel as well to describe the glorified Christ. John receives the commission to write this to the seven churches about what he sees. So the first thing that John sees is seven lampstands, which represent the seven churches from verse 11. And more importantly, John sees Jesus walking among the lampstands. Jesus is walking with believers in the fires of affliction and persecution. And so we can know that today he walks with believers. He's walking with churches as they undergo persecution and difficult circumstances. The churches are compared to lampstands because they hold the light of the gospel. Jesus said, we are the light of the world. In the Old Testament, there were seven gold lampstands that stood in the holy place of the tabernacle in the temple. They held actual oil inside that was burned. And we have the oil inside of us, don't we? The oil of the Holy Spirit that we can let burn and share the light. Zacharias also had a vision of a gold lampstand, Zechariah 4.2. And then John says he sees one like the Son of Man. 
John recognized Jesus because he lived with him for those years that he was on earth. He saw him at the Gal- as a Galilean preacher. He saw him as the glorified God at the transfiguration. And now John sees him as the glorified and forever eternal priest and king. This son of man is Jesus himself. The title son of man... It occurs many times in the New Testament in reference to Jesus as the Messiah. The phrase, one like the Son of Man, draws from the vision of the Ancient of Days in Daniel 7. Jesus himself uses Daniel's Son of Man terminology to describe himself, to reference himself. And here Jesus is clothed with a full garment and a sash across his chest. This describes uh, Jesus as being our High Priest as we know him in Hebrews. John was the only disciple who stood at the cross and witnessed the crucifixion firsthand, and now he sees Jesus, the glorified Lord in heaven, wearing a full-length garment, the high priest with righteousness and honor. And then he goes on to describe the person of Jesus depicted in the only way that he could. And there are seven features that he describes. The first one was his head. It was white as wool, meaning wisdom and purity. In Daniel 7, 9, the Ancient of Days, uh, clothing is white as snow, and the hair of his head is compared to pure wool. So John combines the, the two descriptions to describe the head and the hair of Christ. His eyes piercing in their fiery holiness. The true character of each church is transparent in his eyes. Since this letter was intended for the church, the fire represents how the Lord evaluates our work. In 1 Corinthians 3, Paul spoke of the Lord evaluating our lives as believers by the fire of judgment. This is not judgment for salvation. This is judgment for our works. Whether our works will burn up as hay, wood, and stubble while purifying and preserving the gold, silver, and precious stones. In Daniel 10.6, the eyes of the angelic figure are compared to flaming torches. In Daniel 7.9, the throne of the Ancient of Days is compared to a fire. And then his feet, like burnished bronze, his trials that he experienced on earth, makes him a sympathetic high priest and an experienced judge, Hebrews 4.15. Jesus' feet were like fine brass, and brass speaks of judgment in Scripture, like the brazen altar at the temple. The fire in a furnace speaks of strength and stability. When brass in the furnace reaches a white heat, it becomes a burnished or a flashing, or a glowing brass. His feet as pillars of fire translates glowing brass as if they had been made fiery, red hot in a furnace. His voice, like the sound of many waters, like the noise of a mighty waterfall, his voice of authority stands out above the rest. You ever been to a mighty waterfall? Been to Niagara Falls and stood beside it? When it's really flowing, it's noisy. And there was many waters, many, the sound of many waterfalls just like that, that he was trying to describe the voice of Jesus with. This is similar to Daniel 10.6, where the angelic voice is likened to the sound of a multitude. In his right hand, that's the place of honor where the seven stars are. The seven stars are exposed explained as the messengers of the churches and uh, in any of the study material that I've been looking through that translates into either it could be angels that are <clears throat> excuse me um, are, are sent to be with each church or it could translate into the the leadership of the church his mouth A double-edged sword was coming out of his mouth. That would have been... How would John even translate? You know, seeing a double-edged sword. But that represents the word of God, which is the basis for all judgment. 
This represents the power of his holy word, able to divide soul and spirit, joints and marrow, and a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The sword of the spirit, that double-edged sword is the word of God. And his countenance, Christ's overall appearance was such that it overwhelmed John. The brightness of his countenance was so overwhelming that John collapsed on the ground at his feet as though he were dead. He was overpowered with the greatness and, and the glory that Christ had appeared to him. Even though he had been so familiar with, with Jesus before, he had known him before, it was a mixture of fear, the fear of the Lord, not being afraid, but fear and awe at the Lord revealing himself so profoundly to a human John's reaction shows that he experienced the glory of Christ even more fully here than he did on the Mount of Transfiguration or even after he had risen from the, the dead. John had known Jesus personally on earth. Out of all the disciples, he was the closest one to Jesus. And if this vision caused John to respond that way, what should our re response be in the presence of God? We should be so filled with awe at his presence. When we worship him and we sense his presence in this room, we ought to engage with that and be filled with awe for his presence. Revere him in holiness. That was John's response. What's Jesus' response to John? Well, Jesus comforts John and then he instructs him. Jesus lovingly puts his hand on John and spoke words of encouragement and comfort to him. He said, do not be afraid. Well, why doesn't he have to be afraid? Why doesn't the churches that are going to receive this message have to be afraid? Why don't we have to be afraid? Well, first, he says, I am the first and the last, which is a restatement from verse 8, from eternity to enduring eternity. The first by creation, the last by retribution. The first because before me there is no other God. And last because after me there will be no other. First because from me all things come. And last because to me all things will return. I'm the first and the last. Secondly, you don't need to be afraid because I live. I live and am alive forevermore. I've conquered death. I've opened up the grave. And thirdly, you don't have to be afraid because I have the keys of hell and death. I have a sovereign dominion in and over everything, opening what no one can shut and shutting what no one can open. He speaks of having the keys, and keys are emblems of authority, and all authority is Christ's. So Christ here commanded John to write what he saw, what he has seen, and the current state of the churches, and also about the things which are to come. The seven local churches addressed in Revelation were chosen from among all the churches in Asia, Asia Minor, to serve as examples of the kinds of realities that would play out in the last days in church life now. And if you've read the chapters before, you know that all of them experienced their own set of troubles that they had to overcome. All of the issues that they're confronted with are issues that Christ sees as important for the end time church to be aware of before he comes. I want more revelation, do you? And so let's pull this together for today. The question would be, do you desire to see even a glimpse of the spiritual reality that John saw? Are you ready for greater insight? Are you ready for what that means for you? Is there a hunger in you for more of the Spirit? To have eyes to see and ears to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church? If that is our desire, and if we use John as an example, we would say, that in order to attain those things, here's some keys. We have to draw close to Jesus. We have to be open to what he wants to show us. We have to know his word and be a student of his word. 
We have to honor his presence and offer him our time. And we have to live our life with an undivided heart and singleness of mind. It truly is a high calling that we have. So if that is your desire this morning, and you just want more, I'm going to invite you to stand with me. We're going to pray. And perhaps in, in your life, perhaps there are things that you've been looking at or seeing or entertaining with your eyes that might be a hindrance to you having those spiritual revelations given to you. Perhaps you've been listening to things with your ears that would block out the truth of the word of God and what he wants to say to you. Perhaps your mind has been thinking about some things that would hinder God from being able to show you those things that he wants to show you. Or your heart has been undivided or has been divided somehow. Whatever that case for you is, either you can put your hands on your eyes, your ears, your mind, your heart, and we're just going to pray that God would help us ready ourselves in order to receive the kind of revelation that we're desiring and that he so desires to give us. Amen? Amen. Father, thank you so much because as we look into your word, we know, God, that you desire to give us more and more. You desire to show us who you are. You desire to allow us to hear your voice. And so, Father, I pray that if our eyes have been looking at anything, God, that would hinder what you want to show us, if we've been entertaining anything, I pray, God, that you would remind us that we need to be of singleness of mind when it comes to the things that we look at. God, if our, our ears are blocked because we've been listening to things that go against your word or go against your character, Father, I pray that you would cleanse us, cleanse our hearing, God, and remind us that when those things are being heard, that, God, we take a stand and we close the door to them. Father, if our mind has been occupied with things other than uh, things that are pure and true and right, your word says to think on those kinds of things. God, I pray that you would cleanse our thoughts and that when those thoughts come, that we would be able to take those thoughts captive, as your word tells us to do. God, if our heart has been divided, if our heart, God, has, has been open to other things coming and stealing your time, stealing your honor, God, forgive us for that. And help us, God, to place you on the throne of our heart and to allow you to stay there, no matter what the circumstances. And so, Father, we desire more revelation. And I pray, God, that as we go through this week, and the next weeks and months, God, that we would increasingly, as we submit to you and your word, that we would increasingly have more and more knowledge, discernment, revelation of who you are. Because, God, that's the way we're going to reach the world, is by being able to declare what you are saying to your church, what you are saying to the people who desperately need to know how much that you love them. And so, Father, we honor you, we praise you, we thank you for your presence here this morning. And we ask, God, that you would give us divine appointments this week, that we can share the truth of the gospel with someone who desperately needs to hear. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen. amen. I'm going to close with a song.